All right, let's uh, get back to our study. We're in Acts chapter number 26 and uh, entitled this particular lesson, The Life of a Disciple. And this is uh, <clears throat> probably the most powerful message that Paul preaches in the book of Acts. And uh, he tells us a lot about his, min about his conversion, about his ministry, and all of that. This may be the pinnacle, the apex of the book of Acts. Uh, and then chapters 27 and 28 basically uh, come along to help us understand how Paul ultimately got to Rome. And then it just ends there. We don't know what happened to Paul uh, based on what the Bible says about him after that. We don't have any indication per se. But chapter number 26 in the book of Acts, I'm on page 200, and 85 in my notebook, Acts 26. Acts 26 contains Paul's fifth and final speech in the book of Acts. It's considered to be by many his masterpiece. The speech before Agrippa is a powerful record of the gospel and the implicit demands that the gospel makes in the life of the hearer. In chapter 9, verse 15, we note that the Lord's call on Saul's life was so that he would be a, notice the emboldened print, witness before Gentiles, kings, and Israel. Here in this chapter, Paul stands before a great audience of Gentiles, kings, and rulers, and of course the leadership of the children of Israel. Paul had great opportunities to witness, but he had to take tremendous risks to gain these opportunities. He asked for trouble, and when trouble came his way, trouble always afforded him an opportunity. So obstacles, we said this in an earlier lesson, obstacles afford us opportunities we may never have any other way. So if we're always trying to avoid the difficult as Christians, it may be that you'll live a very bland, mediocre uh, Christian life. But when we take some risks along the way, and I don't mean to be a fool, and I don't mean to offend people intentionally, but when we take risks with the truth of the gospel, there will be opposition, obstacles that come along, but those obstacles, as we see principled in the book of Acts, always afforded Paul greater opportunities to bring the gospel. So think about that if you would. We see an outline of the chapter there in the middle of 285, and then let's pick up our reading where it says, Paul witnesses to Agrippa. Remember, Agrippa had a Jewish background, and because of that, he uh, uh, had a much greater understanding of the theological and religious issues that Paul had been accused of. Festus, Felix, these guys really, they were, they were pagans, pagan Romans, and they really didn't understand uh, the Jewish uh, history, the Jewish faith. But Agrippa did. Agrippa did, and consequently, he understands much more clearly what the issues are uh, that Paul is presenting. Chapter 26, verse 1, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be an expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Basically, Paul is saying, I am propagating, I am preaching what our faith has been preaching and what, what 
our faith is leading up to the coming of the Messiah. So I'm, I'm not doing anything extraordinary, heretical, out of the ordinary, unto which, verse 7, unto which promise our 12 tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I'm accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And when I first got wind of this thing, I was not in favor of this movement, this way among these people. I was very much militantly against it. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put, when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. So Paul served as a witness, another witness, that these particular Christians who were put to death, that they were guilty of violating their Jewish traditions. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. I went out of my way to find these people, strange cities, whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. <clears throat> Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet or befitting for repentance. Prove your repentance, in other words. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to the small and great saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Well, that's quite a message, is it not? Can you imagine Agrippa? Now, Agrippa had the background to generally and maybe very specifically understand everything that Paul was saying. He may have even been able to cite the Old Testament passages that Paul was referencing when he made these statements. He understood what was going on. So, this is a, a quite a testimony, as I said. In 1 through 3 of this chapter, we notice <clears throat> that uh, Paul... Uh, gave an honorable recognition of the, his superiors. He recognized Agrippa's expertise in these matters. Whether he was exaggerating or not, I don't know. I'm going to guess that he wasn't trying to flatter him at all. He was just saying what he believed to be true, that Agrippa was brought in because of his uh, expertise on Jewish tradition. Uh, Paul, in this uh, oration, what he does is he thoroughly identifies with being Jewish. He's not being contentious. 
he's not slandering the Jewish religion or Jewish beliefs. In fact, quite the opposite. He's taking statements, truths that they believe to be true, at least they profess to be true, and he's bringing them forth and putting them on display and saying, Agrippa, what do you think about these things? You know these are things that our people believe, or at least we speak of and we talk about. What do you think of these things? He's very careful in his choice of words. And not that uh, he's being deceptive, he's just being honest. And he knows what another Jew needs to hear to uh, bring conviction on that individual. Why would anyone, especially God's people, find it hard to believe that God would fulfill his promises and is able to raise a dead body to life? Why would they do that? Now, the resurrection is the linchpin of Christianity, no question about it. If Christ is not risen, Paul said, we of all people are most miserable. There's no doubt about that. But the Jews believed in the resurrection. They, they believed that a day would come. This was in their scriptures. They taught it. They preached it themselves. So this was not some new thing that uh, Paul made up and was presenting uh, to these people. He was just saying, I know the person who has fulfilled all of these prophecies from the Old Testament. So anyway, um, here is Paul's message. We've given you a significant amount of commentary on pages 286, 287, 288, 289, just kind of taking this uh, a sermon that Paul preaches here, taking it apart and, uh, and uh, maybe looking at it a little bit more closely than we might have if we just read through the text. So I encourage you to take the time to read the text of the uh, commentary on, uh, on this, pa this passage of Scripture. I think the commentary is very good and it'll probably shed some light on some of the things that maybe you have a little bit of a question about. Well, anyway, let's pick up here on page 290. Festus accuses Paul of losing his mind. Now, remember, Festus is a Roman. He's not a Jew. He doesn't have this Jewish Old Testament background that Agrippa does. So the things that Paul is saying to Agrippa are not, are not weird or unusual to him. But to a Roman pagan who had maybe no religion or maybe, you know, worshipped uh, Roman gods or spiritism or maybe was just an atheist or an agnostic and had no religious leanings or uh, of any kind. This just sounded like people being raised from the dead. I mean, this sounds, this is crazy, crazy stuff. And so Festus accuses Paul of, are you mad? Are you nuts? Verse 24 and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. And the king knoweth, King Agrippa, knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. He knows what I'm talking about. For this thing was not done in a corner. These truths have not been hidden. These are not some secret society. Uh, you don't have to be a member of an exclusive club to know these things. These truths are the truths of, the, of our history, of, our, of the Jewish people, of the Israelites. These things weren't done in a corner. They weren't done out of the way. They're not hidden. So at this point, Paul's declaration of the gospel, Festus interrupts the apostle with a loud and overpowering voice, and he rules Paul to be a nut, a lunatic, someone whose thought life removed him from the real world. Literally, 
Festus declared that Paul's great learning has put him out of a, out of a right frame of mind. To this surprising interjection, Paul responds in calmness, denies the charge of insanity, and maintains that his words are true and his words are very, very serious. There's good reason for Festus to make such a claim, given that he had very little understand, understanding in the nature of the God of Israel and of his mighty powers and of the history of the Israelite people, probably. But nonetheless, the preaching of the resurrection of the dead is the great cause for the divide. Festus only, for Festus only, the immortality of the soul would have been familiar, but never the resurrection of the body. This was something that was brand new to Festus and just was, you've lost your mind. You've gone too far. I can go along with the immortality of the soul, but to say that a person's physical body, I've never seen anything that would give me any evidence that this is true in any sense of the word. So, we pick up our reading in, uh, at the bottom of page 290, where it says that Paul challenges Agrippa. King Agrippa, 26, 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? He zeroes in. We're going to get an invitation here. He zeroes in on Agrippa. He ignores the comments by Festus. You're out of your mind. And he focuses attention on Agrippa. He knows that Agrippa could have or should have some measure of conviction about these things or some understanding. He says, Believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, now, I don't know if this is sincere or if this is sarcastic. You know, when you read it, you can't really pick out a tone of voice. You can't get in the mind of Agrippa. But you know, a lot of people, a lot of uh, preachers, Bible teachers, look at this and say that Paul almost got him. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And uh, that may very, very well be true. It also could be true that Agrippa is mocking Paul and said, well, you know, you got something there. You almost got me. I don't know uh, if he's being uh, cynical, sarcastic, or if he's being honest with his statement there. Maybe eternity will reveal to us. So, and Paul said, verse 29, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds, except being tied up like this and being shipped off to Rome for my vacation. 26, 27 through 29, at the top of 291, Paul then brings his declaration of the gospel to the forefront, and he puts Agrippa on the hot seat. What do you think about this, Herod? You want to make some kind of a decision? Now, the paragraph, that fought, the second paragraph on 291, in response, assuming that, that Agrippa's response is sarcastic, if it d indeed is, Paul responds in a serious tone, revealing Paul's desire that he, Agrippa, and all those sitting there with him listening to would be as Paul himself. It makes me think of the book of Romans and Romans chapter number 10. If you have your Bible there, open to Romans 10 and let's read. This, uh, this shows the passion of the apostle Paul for his brethren, the Jews. In Romans chapter 10, verse 1, Paul writes, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Verse number three there says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they are going about trying to establish their own righteousness. That's, that's, uh, 
that's very characteristic of religious people. I, I know uh, prior to my uh, salvation experience when I trusted Christ as Savior, that was my own testimony. I'd kind of kind of made up a maybe a Heinz 57 version of salvation. Um, I believe the Bible, never read it, but I believed I'd been told that it was the Word of God, so I believed it, just didn't know what it said, or I assumed I knew what it said, that the people that were teaching me were teaching me correctly. I believed that Jesus was God. I believed that He died on the cross. I believe that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. I believe that he was virgin born. I believe that he ascended into heaven. I believe that Jesus would come again. I believe that you could be saved. But I believe this. I believe that my salvation depended upon what Christ had done for me and what I could or would do for him. So this was a collaborative effort, this salvation thing. It depended on Jesus, and uh, as I recall, I was taught that Jesus opened the gates to heaven. Now, there's a truth in that, is there not? But he certainly did a lot more than that. But Jesus opened the gates to heaven, and consequently, now that the gates are open, if I would live my life in accordance with the moral law, with church law, with biblical truth, if I would do that, then I could earn a place in heaven where the gates had been opened. So what I set out to do then was to establish my own righteousness. I looked at the church and what the church said and what the Bible said and what religious authority said, and I weighed their words in light of what I thought. What do I really believe? What do I really embrace as the truth? So, the fact of the matter is, as human beings, we have a way of justifying our faults and our sins. It's easy for us to see the sins of other people, or it's, I should say, easier to see them and not justify them. And it's much easier to look at our sins and excuse ourselves. Uh, to the degree that we don't even think they're sins. It's just, uh, you know, everybody makes mistakes. But those aren't sins that would justly qualify me as a candidate for an eternal and a godless hell. So basically what people do of all religions in all stripes, I don't care if you're a liberal Protestant, if you're a Roman Catholic, and you're following just the dictates of the church, not the scriptures. I don't care if you're uh, Islamic. I don't care if you're uh, a jihadist. <laughs> Whatever it is, you have a way of justifying what you do and make yourself out to be acceptable to God to Jehovah, to Allah, whoever the God is that you claim to worship and are in uh, uh, submission to. So the, that's what the Jews did. The Jews went about to establish their own righteousness. They accepted some things, that is, those things that they knew they could accomplish or do and they'd get an A on, and things that they didn't do so well, they kind of dismissed them and put them off to the side. But anyway, Paul has a heart for these people. In chapter 26, verse number 30, we pick up these words on page 291. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, this man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Now Agrippa even agreed to this. What he know, knew about Old Testament faith in Judaism, he agreed that what Paul said was not offensive to the point that it was worthy of death. It was not blasphemous. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, 
This man might have been set at liberty, he might have been freed, in other words, if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Because Paul appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. That was the decision that was made as a result of that. So, we come to the uh, application page on 292, page 292. Several things that can be said about this particular chapter. 26 is the climax or culmination of the entire message of the book of Acts. Paul's primary goal is, and declared, to, be, to declare the gospel of Christ. The chapter declares Christianity innocent. It's not a seditious movement intended to undermine human government. Never has been. Now, if the human government is immoral, then Christianity will oppose the immorality of the government. Uh, case in point, abortion. Abortion, legal abortion, is the law of the land. I am in opposition to that. That is wrong. That is absolutely wrong as far as I'm concerned, as far as the Bible's concerned. There's no question about that. Particularly now we've got, well, you know, late-term abortions. Now we have infanticide. Children are born, left on an operating table to die if they are unwanted by the parent or the parents of that child. What, we are not even acting like a civilized society any longer. Well, anyway, number two, discipleship is taking the ministry, the message and the mission of God to the world seriously, and it's living the gospel life. Not just preaching the gospel, but living according to the behavioral expectations of the New Testament. Living a life conformed to the image of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. We see the essence of the gospel in 22 and 23. Witnessing to small and great. Christ should suffer. He's the first to rise from the dead. And we're to show light, not just to Israel, but also, according to Isaiah, to the Gentile. So here are some things that you can pick up on, on pages 292, 293. Kind of a reminder of the things that are spoken of in this probably the greatest message, the greatest sermon in the book of Acts. So we're going to take a break right now, take a break for just a few moments, and uh, we'll come back and we're going to look at Paul's voyage and his shipwreck. Paul is now free to go. He's free to go to Rome. He's made an appeal to Caesar, and to Caesar he will go. And the next two chapters chronicle his uh, voyage in his trek to stand before Caesar at Caesar's judgment seat. Let's take a break. <laughs> 